Hey everybody, it's Jeff. Uh, I hope you are enjoying season five of Mana and all the great guys that you are uh, either being introduced to for the first time or maybe you knew and you're just hearing them in a different way. Um, hey, I, uh, it seems like every season uh, I have to do one of these little uh, pre-show messages for an episode that I messed up. And uh, so uh, I'd love to blame it on the technology. I'm sure it's something that I'm doing. Uh, and the irony is I seem to do it uh, on the episodes that I'm most excited for you to listen to. Uh, I remember uh, Ryan Ford in season two, Tim Kennedy season three. Uh, I'm sure I messed up in season four. Uh, and now this season, season five, uh, in this episode here with Rob Birdsell. Um, I remember um, I remember ending the episode with Rob and just being so excited uh, for everybody to meet him. And it was such a great conversation and it is such a great conversation. And then as I'm playing it back, uh, there's just, there's just these little technical snafus in it. And uh, you might not even pick them up, but I pick them up and I wanted to uh, apologize uh, both to Rob and to all of you. Uh, it's just, this just not exactly uh, uh, the, uh, the technical delivery does not match the wonderful messages and the uh, just the insights from Rob. So anyway, uh, the, the way I, I, I the way I'm choosing to uh, to take it is that uh, it's just the Holy Spirit uh, challenging us to just listen just a little bit harder um, uh, so that we can really, really focus on the great message. So enjoy this episode. Sorry. Uh, and uh, hopefully you won't be hearing from me again until season six and, and maybe not even season six. Let's try to maybe get through season six without one of these little technical snafus. Enjoy. A podcast featuring ordinary men of extraordinary faith. This is MANA. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to another episode of MANA, a podcast featuring ordinary men of extraordinary faith. I'm your host, Jeff Peterson. Now, none of the guys that you're going to meet on this podcast would consider themselves to be extraordinary, uh, but it's their humble, holy way of living. That's exactly what makes them extra to me, and I'm very excited for you to meet them. Now, the whole premise of MANA, uh, for those that are just tuning in, is that you know this is a podcast of just a bunch of regular walk around guys that uh, that just happen to live humble, holy lives of faith without necessarily doing a lot of preaching or or reading from scripture, uh, but sometimes, um, and actually kind of all the time, uh, scripture is just, you know, the darn best way of relating to something or someone. So I am actually going to introduce today's guest by way of uh, Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, which for those that haven't committed that to memory yet, is, uh, is often referred to as the parable of the talents. And I'm not going to read it verbatim, but for uh, for anyone uh, who's been within shouting distance of a church, uh, you've heard this story of a master who is uh, leaving this house. Um, uh, he's going on a trip. And before he leaves, he, uh, he brings his three servants and he basically entrusts uh, portions of his, uh, his property and they call him talents. Um, which was basically some old term uh, would, it would like money, okay? And, and talents were really um, valuable. Uh, some estimates, you know, uh, that you look up now, they say uh, like a t one talent was worth like twenty years worth of a of a of a worker's wages, okay? So, so this is not these. This was not an insignificant thing that this that this you know master was doing. So he's basically he's got, he's got his three servants. He's like, all right, I'm heading out of town, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave each of you, uh, some talents, uh, to basically like take care of these talents for me while I'm gone. So the first guy, he gives like five talents. Second guy gives two, third guy gets one. Okay. So he kind of portions them out based on, you know, kind of their ability. So, so, so the last guy only gets one talent. So, uh, master comes home after his trip and he basically, uh, gets everybody together, says, all right, how'd y'all do? Uh, like, what are my talents? And the first two guys basically say, hey, we took your talents and we invested them and we, we got more. Uh, and so, of course, he, the master is very pleased. Uh, it goes to the third guy uh, who only had one. And the third guy says, hey, listen, I knew you're kind of a demanding guy and I only had one talent, so I didn't want to lose it. So I basically, you know, put it in a coffee can and it buried it in the backyard. 
and um and the master just loses it he's like what the heck i i get i entrusted this with you and you just basically like he didn't do anything with it. You kind of, and so anyway, he rewards the first two, punishes the last guy, and that's basically the story. So the punchline of the whole thing is that while you would think that the, you know, the third uh, uh, servant was just being really responsible, you know, he, he didn't want to, he was, he was, he was managing not to lose. Um, that's actually not what the master was looking for. Okay, and so then. The connection, of course, and the connection that I'm making to today's guest is that today's guest embodies that parable for truly um, making the most and, and really trusting in God to make the most of what he's been given um, and not without risk. Um, so uh, this today's guest, after starting his career in a, a very uh, sort of stable uh, career in teaching, uh, and then moving into consulting and then kind of a almost a quasi corporate kind of gig as a president and CEO of the Cristo Ray Network of Schools, uh, which is a fantastic network of schools across the U.S. Um, he cut the cord. He took he took his talents and he's like, all right, here I go. So he cut the cord uh, from anything uh, resembling any semblance of job security. <laughs> and he spent the last uh, really 10 years founding and leading some very cool ventures uh, that kind of operate at this really cool intersection of education and faith. Uh, and they have appropriately cool names like the Accelerate Institute and the Drexel Fund and Amerigo Education and the Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship and Education and the Catholic and Catholic Virtual. So, I mean, not only is this guy like living it, he's also branding it very well. So this is just cool times 10. So anyway, he's been investing his talents in both the biblical sense, because this is real, you know, these are dollars, um, but also in our more modern day definition of what talents are, our gifts, you know, his intellect, his versatility in straddling these very different sectors of education and faith and commerce, um, his deep faith, his loyalty to his friends, uh, even those like myself who don't keep up with him nearly as much as I should. Um, and most importantly, his devotion to his family, uh, of which he made the very, very wise choice to course correct his own errant collegiate ways uh, of the past to encourage his very talented daughters to be gophers and not badgers. So yeah, he, he's, he, which is also a testament to, he never stops learning. You know, he, he everyone can, everyone is, Everyone is fixable. So anyway, please welcome today's Mana Man, uh, Mr. Rob Birdsell. Hey, Rob. Hey, Jeff. That's uh, that was that was really interesting. <laughs> uh, I think the thing I'm most impressed with is you like my branding. I do. From a marketing guy, I'm like, wow. Okay, I guess I guess it's, that was pretty good. I do. I mean, these are these are these are these are things that you, anybody would want to be investing their time and and uh, and talents into. So yes, you've got it in you. So I know that that yeah. intro was a little bit longer than I intended. I kind of needed a bookmark about halfway through, but uh, but I really, you know, when I think of you know, and as you've heard, and as uh, as as others have heard, every guy on Mana has my deepest admiration for just being these solid men of faith. But but everyone's got you know kind of that distinguishing thing that sort of you know like a brand kind of kind of you know kind of occupies a special place in my heart and really this 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 you know kind of i'm going to call it courage this courage that you have been demonstrating uh you know over the last several years is just so cool that you that you've and it, and it echoes that parable so that's kind of where i want to start you know for those that don't know you that don't know you know the work that you've done i actually kind of want to put you on the spot a little bit to just kind of explain what you're doing today with Catholic Virtual and with uh, Amerigo. Because I think, and then we'll kind of work backwards into like, you know, you know, history and blah, 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 blah. But I think, I think the, the specific work that you're doing is a really good illustration of this investment that you're making in, in your own talents and in the work that, uh, that I think really God has called you to do. Um, sure, Jeff. And, and the, the two organizations are, are really exciting. And and I love being sort of the Catholic guy in each organization. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> the CEO of one of the organizations said, Rob is the closest thing we're ever going to have to a bishop on our team. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't, know, I don't know how to respond to that. But uh, so, you know, the first one that you mentioned, Amerigo Education, 
five and a half years old. We started it, a uh, colleague of mine, he and I, and a private equity firm saw an opportunity to, to help international students get a leg up on going to top American universities. So that, you know, if somebody wants to go to the University of Minnesota, uh, they're going to have a much better chance of getting into the University of Minnesota if they graduate from Crete and Durham Hall in the Twin Cities. So uh, they hired us to start this organization that recruits students from around the world to go to schools like Crete and Durham, which is one of our partner schools. And we board them in, uh, in off-campus private housing. And we staff them with dorm parents and English language teachers. And uh, last year, we had 80 graduates. And every one of them got into a top 100 university. So mm. that that is the goal of it. And um, it's also great for these Catholic high schools to get the diversity. You know, Creighton Durham has, um, has about 35 or 40 students this year. Even in the pandemic, we're still able to get some kids here. And I think, if I recall, they're from eight different countries. And, yeah. you know, imagine being uh, in your high school world history course, and you're about to study Vietnam, and you've got two Vietnamese kids in your class. Yeah. That, that just made that a lot more interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's a miracle. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, had a rough go, as many organizations have uh, for the past year and a half. And so I was asked to assist another company that this firm, uh, they have an online education company, and one of their business units is Catholic Virtual. And we support Catholic schools with their online strategies. And it's a, you know, we have a great partnership with Marquette University. So high school students could next year earn dual credit online through Marquette and Catholic Virtual. So in, in a semester, you take a Marquette course, you get three college credits and a full year of high school credit which is really an incredible thing. Imagine graduating from high school with nine or 12 college credits from a top 100 American university. Mm -hmm. um, we, we supplement their curriculum. So, you know, a lot of Catholic high schools aren't as big as Crete and Durham, and they may not be able to offer as robust a curriculum. So it's a great story, Jeff. I, I met uh, one of our students. She goes to Trenton Catholic Academy in New Jersey, uh, about 250, 300 students. She wanted to go to the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, you need to take calculus in high school to even apply. Well, they didn't offer it. It wasn't, they didn't have enough students to have a calc course at Trenton Catholic. So she took it online with Catholic Virtual. Not only did she get into RIT, but she got a full academic scholarship. Wow. That's awesome. So those are, those are, you know, some of the ways we're working with Catholic schools today, which is, I, I just love being in, you know, I was in five Catholic high schools in Houston this week, and it's just, such inspiring work that they're doing. Yeah, well, and I and I love as we, as you and I've talked. I love this this intersection that you are operating in with education and in and and faith. Has have those two things? I mean, obviously, you started your career as a teacher, which I want to talk about uh, in a little bit here. You know, ha, has that always been? Have those two ingredients and and those interests been with you like forever? Have, has that always kind of been kind of your two? kind of your one, two punch kind of education and, and, and religion, or did one, did you lead more with one and then it kind of turned into like, Oh my gosh, I guess I'm now, you know, like you say, I'm kind of the resident Bishop guy, <laughs> you know, like, or, or, or were they always kind of an equal proportion? No, it actually led with religion. I, I, um, I don't know if you know this, but I spent many years discerning um, a call to the Jesuits, to the society of Jesus. Huh? And uh, so that was sort of the lead. Uh, in fact, Senior year of high school, I said to one Jesuit, I want to, I want to enter and become a Jesuit. And he said, you're too young, go to college. And, uh, <laughs> That's a practical <laughs> Jesuit right there. <laughs> um, so it, I, you know, faith has always been at the forefront and that led me to teaching, which okay. uh, then became sort of the profession. There was a period you mentioned where I, after teaching, I got my MBA and spent seven years in, in management consulting and Jeff, I hated every day of it. Hmm. I was constantly trying to find a way back to education and, um, and Chris story was that way back. Yeah. Well, and I did want to ask about that. So after like, how, what was it, uh, after teaching and after kind of, you know, what, what, what was the, what, what moved you out of that? Like, what was it, a uh, just kind of a, and this is such a cliche, but it was it kind of a grass is always greener kind of a thing or, or, or did you just have a sense that there was a kind of more that you were supposed to be doing beyond the classroom. What, what precipitated that move? Um, that's a good question. There are a few answers to that. Uh, one, 
probably the biggest one is uh, my wife is also a teacher and she came home one day pregnant with her second daughter and said she's she doesn't want to be other kids moms she wants to be a mom to our two kids yeah and there went half our cash flow <laughs> so, <laughs> so the reality of being a father and two kids and you know yeah. a, a wife and mother who i re- fully respected wanted to to be at home um it, that was one that was pr- the primary one but the second one um my wife says a professional attention deficit i uh, <laughs> I, I i like to, i like change i like to learn new things i like to do new things and after seven years in the classroom I loved it, but I was I was ready for something new and a new challenge. And the other one, the way I taught and when I was, you know, I coached all three seasons. I was at school at seven. I was working till 10. I worked, you know, track meets, cross country meets, ski meets on the weekends. Like, it'd be hard to be a good father in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, when I got home, I was all in with my daughter, Julia. Like, that's all I wanted to do. I found it so hard to grade papers when she's around or prep for the next day and um if i was gonna be a teacher i was all in so part yeah. of me was like i want to go out you know a great teacher not mm-hmm. burnt out or not all in yeah yeah no that's great and i love how so so you know you talk about that that sort of segment that tranche in kind of more of the whatever corporate consulting how far in if you can remember because i mean for for, for, you know, for working for the man, if you will, I mean, you still had some pretty cool gigs. I mean, that Christo Ray network of schools is, is honestly just so for those listeners that don't know anything about Christo Ray, we're not going to belabor it here, but it's worth going online. It is, it is truly, I think one of the most divine educational uh, systems uh, ever. And so, so it's not that you were, you know, selling deodorant, you know what I mean? It's not like you were some ad guy, you know, totally selling, you know, your soul. But when did you realize that, that, that you wanted to get, or was that what Christo Ray was? Was was the movement towards that to try to get you back to kind of where your home base was in in kind of that education and faith space? Yeah, no, that was it. That was that was the homecoming. I mean, I I loved those five years, and it, it was amazing. We opened twelve new Catholic high schools serving exclusively low income kids. I mean, it, it's mm-hmm. it's amazing, and uh, yeah. uh, that was that was the return, if you will back to Catholic mm-hmm. education, to faith and education. Yeah, that's so cool. Well, and if we can just go back, we're going to do a little Benjamin Buttons now and go way, way back. You know, when you talk about, and I didn't know about the about the potential, you know, calling to the to, to clergy, uh, that vocation. So I would imagine then, you know, if you're, if you're you know, you know, a teenager and picturing a life, you know, as, as a Jesuit, I mean, you must have had, faith must have been, I'm guessing, a pretty integral part of just growing up in the bird cell household. What was it like uh, as a kid growing up with, with faith? Yeah, no, you know, I, uh, prior to high school, uh, it was an obligation. You know, it was, we we're pretty traditional Catholic family. You know, we prayed before meals, you know, we went to mass on Sundays and, but it was, it was just, a, there wasn't a, I wouldn't say there wasn't a, a depth of spirituality in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grade school was fine, but you know, I, I didn't have, there was no faith formation in grade school, even though I went to a Catholic grade school. I, you know, I learned the Bible verses and I learned the prayers and all that, but there wasn't a, a richness. And, and it's hard when you're a grade school. Like I, I'm not blaming the school, but yeah. then I got to market high, Jeff, and everything changed. The yeah. Jesuits were just, I was like, these guys are so cool and they're <laughs> so into prayer. But not only those guys, but like Thursday mass, voluntary mass, all the cool seniors, all the football players were there leading it. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, what's going on here? This is mm-hmm. <laughs> this yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah. And that that experience at Market High was just transformative and an amazing, as, as most Jesuit institutions are, just amazing formative experience. Yeah, can you remember back to you know? Um, I'm sure you had several, but were there any role models back then? You know, whether whether they were you know, teachers or Jesuit, uh, you know, uh, Jesuit priests themselves, or, or even some of those peers, like, do you remember, or do any, do any guys in particular stand out as being, um, remarkably impressionable at that age? Uh, well, there are a few Jesuits, uh, one in particular, Father Steve Schlesser, who is now at Loyola University, uh, probably the smartest man I've ever met in my life. And he could just explain things to me about our faith and our church that blew me away 
he was the one who actually said, <laughs> I want to become a Jesuit. He's like, there you go. <laughs> 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 um, so he was one that was intellectually I found amazing. Then there's another one who, for your listeners in Minneapolis, may know him, Father Warren Tazama. He's the pastor of the Jesuit parish in Minneapolis. Um, he, he was just a great practical man. Uh, we had a group, um, a Christian life community, our junior and senior year that we would meet once a month on Sunday nights and, you know, we'd, we'd have mass and then we'd share our faith. And it was pretty remarkable hearing these guys from all over Milwaukee talking about their struggles and their faith. And, and, um, so those would be two things that really stand out, uh, Father Schlesser's intellect and, and ability to explain things. And then Father Sazam was bringing an eclectic group. Now, this is before diversity and stuff like that was, was, you know, intentional. He, but he said, we're going to get three or four guys from the North shore of Milwaukee, three from three or four at the South side, three or four at the West side and three or four from the city. Yeah. And it was a diverse group that was sharing their faith for, for two years together. Mm-hmm. That's, that's just amazing. You know, that, that, uh, just to hear you describe it, it's very enviable. I, I think that setting and, and how cool is it for just, again, for that, for that really impressionable, those, those teen years to be surrounded not only by the men that you're describing, but also like you, like you mentioned, you know, it's, you know, you're going to church, you're going to the youth group and you're seeing all of the, you know, kind of quote unquote cool kids, you know, the, the, you know, you're seeing the football players, you're seeing the, those really influential peers that, uh, are, are into it. I think that's great. Really great. Let's, um, let's, uh, let's segue. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's, uh, time goes by so fast here, but, uh, we're already to the, uh, to kind of the fun segment here. And I know, um, I know you you've been looking forward to this since I've been badgering you to get on the show. So this is the, uh, this is the segment. We have the same three questions that we ask every guest and, um, and then we just kind of see where they want to take it. Uh, and I will say, uh, and I, and I, and listeners, I, I have no idea what Rob is going to do, uh, or, or say on this, but knowing his, uh, creativity, he may very well be falling in line. And Rob, I haven't even told you this for whatever reason, season five, which is the season you're on, we've had a rash of rule breakers on, on the fun segment where they're taking these questions and then saying, you know, I kind of answered it this way. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. We're hitting our five year itch or something. So I wouldn't be surprised if Rob is going to take some creative liberties here, but if not, you know, uh, we, it, we will admire his, his, uh, his discipline here. So anyway, fun segment question. Number one, if Jesus knocked on your door, uh, down there in the greater Chicago area and, uh, and just wanted to hang out for the day. What are you going to do with him? So I didn't know what the rules were, so I've actually got two answers. So I'm probably ready. <laughs> there we go. Right there. <laughs> right there. <laughs> so because I didn't know what the rules were, I thought, okay, so he's coming to my door. Do we have to like hang out here somewhere? Or I'm like, no, oh, he's got like a secret jet that we can get on. And, <laughs> and we're going to fly to Colorado. And, and this summer I had, I think I told you about this. I had the chance to hike from Crested Butte to Aspen with my daughter yeah. and my wife. And there were moments there, Jeff, where I was just in a zone somewhere else. I mean, yeah. all of a sudden I turn around and be like, wait, we just hiked that whole damn thing? <laughs> and I would love to do that hike with him. Uh, so if this, if that rule is allowable that I can stick with this, or I have another one, if, if that's no, not allowable, no, go let's hear, no, let's hear them both. Those, that was a great one. So, so we do that walk and, and hike with him and just be in his presence. Cause I did on that hike, I, I felt many times God's presence and mm-hmm. the beauty and just like, I needed that. Like after this rough year, we've all been through and just to see that astounding beauty, I was like, God, thank you. But okay, if I didn't, if you wouldn't allow me to go on the secret uh, Jesus ship, you got that. Uh, <laughs> we were going to go down to, we live on the north side of Chicago, and there's a beach that, that we spend a lot of time, Gilson Beach uh, in Wilmette. And this time of year is kind of nice because people sort of emptied out of the beach and you can pretty much, you're probably going to have it to yourself. And I'd love to get our chairs out, out from our place where we store our stuff and sit down with him. And uh, you know what? I'd like to talk to him, Jeff, about the parts of his life we don't know. Mm. Tell me about your family. Like, mm-hmm. you know, what what was it like, you know, for, before the wedding of Canaan? You know, you know, we we got the birth, 
He's got a few stories there when he's young, and then all of a sudden he's like thirty. It's yeah, like, right. Okay, okay, come on, people, come on, you gotta give me something in there for those twenty years. <laughs> so I I would dig into those twenty years, those twenty five years we don't know about. And like, what was it like being an adolescent and being Jesus, and, mm-hmm. and what was your family like? And we know I don't know what we're doing, brothers and sisters and. You know, what was your relationship, you know, with your dad like? There's not a lot there about Joseph. And mm-hmm. so I would just spend the day sitting at the beach asking him questions and have him tell me about the hidden years, if you yeah. will. Oh, I love that. And and actually, I, I thought about that too, particularly with with Joseph. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, like there's there's nothing. We got nothing to go on with Joseph. Nothing. That, with, it's yeah. amazing to me. Yeah. It, it is. It's, but, but he's St. Joseph the worker and, and you know, um, I think that's why so many people have such an affinity for Mary because there is so much there. Uh-huh. Um, and, um, and, you know, people like St. Ignatius and there's so many people that had such a strong affinity for, uh, for Mary because there's so much there. Whereas yeah. Joseph, <laughs> there's not much there. Yeah. Just, uh, just like a lot of us dads just kind of get the <laughs> short end of the stick. <laughs> just, just keep paying the rent and you keep paying the rent, Joe. Okay. Uh, fun segment question number Two, uh, if you could go to church with any other guy, living or dead, famous or not, uh, you could know him, you could have not known him, um, doesn't matter. Then this is where you have a lot of range, but it's just got to be a guy and you're going to go to church. Who are you going to go to church with? Okay, well, I'm going to break a rule again. Um, uh-huh. I'm going to do one dead, one living because I couldn't pick. Like these okay. are two, <laughs> two guys that are just so big in my mind. Uh, Thomas Merton. Um, very influential in my life as I was discerning being a Jesuit and, and just uh, seven story mountain is remarkable. And, and unfortunately we lost him too young and I never got to meet him, but he would be one I just think would be like great to go to mass with and then go get a cup of coffee afterwards. And be like, what'd you think of that mass? What do you think yeah. about that sermon? Yeah. Uh, and the other one is, is living uh, Richard Rohr, father Rohr, a Franciscan and uh, just so out there. And, mm-hmm. You know, he, you know his stuff about. I don't know if you've read or heard of the Universal Christ, and uh, it's just, it just takes me three times to read his stuff to figure out some sense of what he's talking about. So those would be my two: Thomas Merton yeah. and Richard Rohr. Oh, that fan- no, and Rohr is yeah, he's fantastic. I'm almost sure. I think Richard Rohr. I mean, he's written so many books, but one book that um, that I read early on, I think I'm almost positive it was him. It was um, uh, Why Be Catholic. And it was just this very straightforward, no nonsense, um, really easy to read because I'm not a great reader. Um, and I remember just loving it. It's out of print now. You can't even get it, but it's uh, mm. still have a copy of it and I'll go make sure that it was him. But yeah, just a fantastic um, thinker and, and communicator and just, uh, yeah, a giant. You know, a for book, sure. a, yeah, a book of his that was now at, at our stage in life, amazing for me, falling upward about the second half yes, of life. Yes, amazing yes. Amazing book. Amazing, yeah. amazing book. Yeah. Anyone I've given it to is just like, he's talking to me. I'm like, no, he's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, the mark of a great writer. Well, uh, that, oh, and the last question. Oh my gosh, I almost, I got so yeah, excited about like, Richard Rohr there. Is, I know. The most important one. <laughs> I got so excited about Richard Rohr there. I was going to wrap her up here. All right, so last, last question. Fun segment question number three. Uh, if you could give one piece of advice, just one, uh, at least that's what the rule is. We'll see where you take it. But if you could give one piece of advice, to a younger man um, about living a, a just a life like yours, just a, a life of, you know, humble, holy faith, but strong faith. What would that one piece of advice be? Um, this is a great question, by the way. And, and I will stick to the rules on this one. And it would be to have a daily prayer life mm-hmm. that um, for me, for many years, I was, you know, I think I'm doing good work. I'm opening up new Catholic schools for low income kids and so on and so forth. But um, uh, there's going to be a time in everyone's life where they hit a, a dark patch. And if they don't have a personal relationship with God and with Jesus, it's going to be a lot more difficult than if they had a, a daily prayer life. And so, you know, Pope Francis, when somebody uh, said, well, I don't, have, I don't have 30 minutes a day to pray. And he said, well, then you should be praying an hour a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And right. so I, I would, uh, my advice would be 20 to 30 minutes every day in prayer. That's great. Yeah. That, that, that is, and so simple. And, uh, but you're absolutely right. That's, uh, that's, 
a great, uh, a great recipe for sure. All right. Well, um, now we are at the end of the show. So, uh, Rob Birdsell, thank you so much for, um, just being a part of my life for sharing so much of your life uh, or parts of your life today with, uh, with our manic I so just, uh, thank the world of you and just really thank you for, for being with us here today and, uh, wish you all the best in your continued investing of your talents, um, for, uh, for God. So. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for what thank you're doing. Thank you for listening to MANA. If you have any questions or recommendations for future guests, send them to manapodcast at gmail.com.